Welcome everybody uh, to this round table to discuss the corporate capture of multilateralism that is being organized by the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism. I'm Sulakshana Nandi from the People's Health Movement joining you from India. And I will be moderating this discussion along with Sophia Monsalve, who's the General Secretary of FIAN International. So before we proceed, I would like to make some technical announcements. Uh, speakers will be speaking in English and Spanish. Uh, so I request you to select the language that you want at the beginning, and you can choose the language from your meeting settings as seen uh, on the slides, both uh, from the laptop or from the phone, depending on what you're using. And please feel free to introduce yourself and uh, post your comments in chat. And uh, we are really hoping for a lively um, uh, discussion today, lively and interactive discussion today. And um, I will request uh, Sofia to just um, explain this in Spanish first before we go ahead. Gracias, Sulaxana, y muy buenas tardes, días o noches a todas las participantes. Thank you, Sulaxana. Good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you who have joined us today. We are very happy to of offering this online seminar with interpretation into Spanish. We want to thank our team of interpreters, especially David and Monica, for making it possible for more people to participate in today's discussion. Please remember to click on the globe icon in the lower right hand side of your screen there you can select the language of your choice thank you thank you sophia um so our future is at stake and today's event is an opportunity for us to come together to interrogate and share notes on the influence of the corporate agenda on global governance and global decision making bodies and its implications for people and governments so it is an opportunity to organize and join our struggles towards more democratic and inclusive world. And we are honored to have with us today four panelists who bring in decades of experience and expertise on this issue. Uh, so first of all, I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Barbara Figueroa, who's the Secretary of Sustainable Development Trade Union Confederation of the Americas, TUCA. She's a philosophy professor, trade unionist, and Chilean politician. She has served as a leader of trade unions in Chile and was part of the electoral command of the recently elected president of Chile, Gabriel Boric. We congratulate on her and her comrades for the win, and we welcome her to the panel. Uh, we have Rosa Pavanelli, General Secretary of the Global Union Federation Public Services International, uh, who's been uh, the General Secretary since 2012. She's the Commissioner on UN Secretary General's High Level Commission on Health, Employment and Economic Growth, and also a member of UN High Level Experts and Leaders Panel on Water and Disasters. Rosa Pavanelli has been part of labor unions in Italy, uh, especially the FPCGIL, and held posts at regional and national levels. PSI is a member of the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism, and we warmly welcome her to the panel. The third panelist that we have is Harris Gleckman. Um, Harris Gleckman is a senior fellow at the Center for Governance and Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and director of Benchmark Environmental Consultant. Um, Dr. Gleckman has a PhD in sociology and he's worked with the UN on trade transnational corporations, development and financing. And uh, he has been supporting the People's uh, Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism since the beginning and we are very grateful for his contributions and we welcome him to the panel. And last but not the least, we have uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who is a long-standing member of parliament elected since 1983 and represents the London constituency of Islington North. He's also served as the head of the Labour Party in opposition from 2015 to 20. Jeremy Corbyn is a tireless campaigner inside and outside of parliament for a fairer, more equal and peaceful world for all, both in the UK and internationally. He brings to his work a strong defense of democracy and multilateralism. We are very pleased that he's with us today. A warm welcome to all the panelists and participants who have joined us. I will now hand over to Sophia, who will be introducing the topic that we are discussing today. 
Yes, many thanks, uh, Sulakshan, and many thanks again uh, to all participants for joining us today. I have the difficult task to open our exchange, sharing with you key insights of our collective process of analysis, reflection, and action uh, that started uh, in 2019. This process is what we call today the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism. So how this, uh, did this start? Our organizations work on different areas of concern, climate and environment, education, food, health, public services, internet and communications technologies. In each of these areas, we have been confronted with deep crises, whether it is climate collapse, mass extinction of species, ecological destruction, hunger and malnutrition, pandemics like COVID, but also obesity, extreme inequality and concentration of wealth and power, widespread human rights violations, repression and violence, as well as the proliferation of authoritarian, xenophobic, racist, and misogynist forces. Most of these problems are global in scale. They, are, they therefore need coordinated responses. On the other hand, key structural factors responsible for the crisis originate in unfair global policies and rules, which have facilitated the rapid expansion of financial capitalism with all the devastating consequences that we know. That is why our organizations have been engaged in trying to reshape and democratize the UN and the so-called global governance of each of these policy areas. In this engagement, we have come across the overwhelming influence of corporate power in policymaking. One could also describe this development as the increasing privatization of policymaking and public international institutions. This corporate capture of multilateral public institutions through revolving doors, unregulated lobby, policy interference, corporate and philanthropic funding of UN agencies, as well as of funding of science and other forms of shaping public opinion has been going on for several decades. But something seems to be new, or at least we see it now clearer, a new emerging global governance system that seeks to bring together global actors that have a potential stake in an issue and ask them to collaboratively sort out a solution. So it is not anymore about indirect influence, but about creating a new ecosystem of institutions where TNCs or their front groups sit with voice and vote to decide on key areas and issues of global policies that impact the planet and its peoples. This is what we call multi-stakeholderism for lack of a better term. Now, this emerging global governance system is informal, opaque, and operates without formal rules. This makes it elusive and difficult to track. It makes it also fluid and always evolving and adapting to the pressures it encounters on its way. It diverges from the multilateral governance system established at the end of World War II in which governments as representatives of their citizens take the final decisions on global issues and direct international organizations to implement these decisions. We are deeply concerned about the implications of this development for people's sovereignty and for democracy. This is the ultimate reason why we have come together in this working group. Multi-stakeholderism pretends to be an important part of the solution to our current crisis. It portrays itself as inclusive and participatory, as innovative and more efficient and effective, as a way to overcome the funding crisis of public institutions. Indeed, it has become so much common sense in global policy circles that it is hard to challenge. But we're here to meet this challenge of questioning this development and of contrasting it with an alternative vision from below. The book that we are presenting today is probably the most solid effort so far to gather systematic evidence about the actors, the scope and the geographies of multi-stakeholderism in several policy fields. In reality, 
multi-stakeholderism won't strengthen the UN nor find real solutions to the urgent problems of our times. The failures of the UN Food Systems Summit and the COVAX initiative illustrate where multi-stakeholderism is taking us to, to deepening market-based solutions for financial capitalism and to consolidate the power of corporations and neo-colonial structures. It is therefore very concerning that the UN Secretary General intends to scale up multi-stakeholderism or networked multilateralism, as he calls it, um, this new governance system. In September 2020, he released his report, Our Common Agenda, in which he presents his vision for the future of global cooperation and the UN. So this is where we stay now. And today in our discussion, we would like to start asking Harris, uh, what is his opinion about this report on our common agenda? And what are the main challenges that this agenda is putting? And we would also like to ask our, uh, the rest of our panelists, um, how do they see the problems of multi-stakeholderism in their area of work? What are the challenges uh, regarding the growing influence of corporate power in global governance? Thank you very much. Sophia, thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers of the panel for inviting me. You know, we live in a very weird time. Many of when they, we went to school, we learned that governance was done by governments. And of course, behind the go, that, those government speak, uh, speakers, there were corporate influences. And there were battles going on for the, in the civil society. But, in the, but the primary purpose, primary representative in those governments uh, the debates were governments. And corporations sat behind them, be it from colonial days, into the 1980s. What's changed now, as Sophia is saying, is instead of the corporations being behind, they now officially want a seat in the governance system. But there's a very vague set of rules about how this new governance system reacts and behaves, which is a risk for all of us. And that makes it weird because we have a disconnect between our experience and what's actually happening. For example, in my 20 plus years at the United Nations, my, with my colleagues, we'd say, what do governments want us to do in this area? What do we understand our assistant secretary generals or undersecretary generals interpret the government's wishes? Now, the reality is we need to, the secretariats are being encouraged by their senior leaders to say, what do the corporate sector want in these areas? And changes the entire dynamic. It's quite a weird process. It's rather a shocking transformation. And as Sophia was saying, we're looking at the next step in that transformation. Key movements along this area was an agreement a couple of years ago by the Office of the Secretary General with the World Economic Forum for a new strategic partnership. What's interesting about this formal memorandum of understanding is that the Secretary General did not share this uh, process with governments. He marginalized them. The Secretary General did not go to them and say, here's our plan of action. Will you agree to it under this memorandum of understanding? No, the power of this arrangement is to increase the strength of the office of the secretary general and the equivalent executive directors over what were the core body, the governments. As Sophia was saying that in response to the 75th um, anniversary around the UN, the Secretary General was asked, where do you see we, how, the future going? How should we structure the future? Because the world's quite different than it was at the end of the Second World War. And again, as Sophia was saying, the nature of the crises have changed. 
what the Secretary General uh, presented uh, at the end of the year, we call our common agenda. So let me just stop for a moment and say that we have to be very careful about a massive effort at co-optation co of vocabularies. Inclusiveness, which is something that many in the civil society have been pushing for for 30 or 40 years, meant bringing in the different components from farmers to educators, to scientists, to community organizers as separate pieces. Now, in the Secretary General's use of the word inclusiveness, uh, and is that each separate part of the investment community, and the, the banking community, the financial advisors, the manufacturers, each one should be separately recognized, and there should be a seat for civil society. So the language, and the language is entailed even in this title, which says our common future. No, there are marked differences between the needs that are expressed by the bulk of the world and those who are now wanting to sit at the table. It is not common. It's not an our reality. So in the proposals presented, and there is a differences going on within the UN by some of the governments, what is being suggested? The Secretary General says, here's a series of new issues that need urgent attention. In fact, identify seven of them, from uh, digital issues to reducing violence, particularly for women and girls, as he phrases it, um, stock taking on climate. And he asks, that these be set up as multi-stakeholder groups for which his office, in this case his, will decide who is on those bodies and further marginalizing governments. So you take the new issues which do need attention and you assign them outside to a multi-stakeholder body which has a dominant role by those who have the greatest power. It's interesting that the Secretary General's paper calls for no new intergovernmental negotiations. Another way in which multi-stakeholderism is permeating the, the Our Common Agenda paper is that its process will uh, culminate in 2030 with what he calls a multi-stakeholder summit for the future. So all the preparatory processes in the next two years will result in an outcome by the multi-stakeholder summit of the future, then somehow governments are supposed to accept it. Doesn't it even indicate that there should be a government review of this advice? Um, additional multi-stakeholder initiatives which are implied in the paper are that the newly formed UN women should move to a multi-stakeholder. Uh, structure for dealing with what are called employment issues, discrimination issues, narrowing it sharply down by mo and moving it outside of a multi multilateral system. What's the consequences? Well, let me just identify three. Is a significant shift in power to the executive directors and the secretary general offices away from the intergovernmental system, away from governments, because the secretary general's office and the director general's offices are invited to describe not only the issues needed attention, but which corporations and which leaders and which civil society or civil academics should handle that question. It also means that the private sector will be invited to have multiple public pressure my presence, but the civil society will be now back to being reduced to a single or more limited set of chairs. And perhaps more uh, crucially for where we're trying to go is that the major issues that Sophia was raising will now go quiet. 
because the idea in back of addressing any of those questions requires a fundamental change in globalization, in the rules of structure, and in what market opportunities the business community see, sees. And so the UN leadership will become not the moral voice that it has been, but much more restrained. So it's in these uh, quantitative change in step that I think it's important that we are discussing here this morning. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Harris. Um, now we can hear from the next, from the other panelists. Uh, I don't know who wants to go first. Again, I recall the question was, what are the implications of this shift in governance into your area of work and of concern? Barbara, perhaps let's start with you. You have four minutes. Thank you. Perfect, Perfect. thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for having invited us as the Union Confederation of the Americas. This is a very impactful topic uh, for the area of labor, which is our area of work. We have also been reflecting with our organizations. Harris said in the region and the Americans and in the Caribbean, we see that the so-called development models have been imposed. They highlight capital and luxury, and they put them over people and their rights and the environment. This has promoted this scenario with impunity of transnational corporations. In our opinion, there have been attacks to democracy. There has been a lack of social dialogue, a lack of acknowledging the role of civil society. We've seen attacks to democracy in our countries and our region, and we believe we're not certain, but we also have no doubt that it is this very um, scenario of impunity has definitely favored this attack to democracy in order to guarantee the advance of capital in our territories and our countries. And with that, uh, there has been an exploitation of our natural resources and also the labor conditions of the workers. In the sense, for us, it's important to highlight what we have been seeing in the reports that we have developed from the CSI, CSA. There was a report published in November 2018, Universal, Universal Trade Union, which had as a title, the scandal of exploiting corporate power. We saw in Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, El Salvador, and Panama, we saw 25 transnational companies of 25, over 25,000 workers. They had a hidden labor force of 70 million workers, which at the time represented 95% of the labor force of these transnational corporations. These were hidden workers. We calculated there were 17 hidden workers for every one legally hired worker, legally hired by these companies. This has been allowed, like Harris said, by these policies where governments and states lose their positions and they give away to the economic policies. So to say, we've also seen this in our own reports. We have a labor observatory in the Americas, and we have highlighted the impact of the pandemic on the global value chains in Latin America and in the Caribbean. We published our report in August 2021, and we highlighted that TNCs made the most of the pandemic to implement policies which led to human rights and labor and union uh, rights workers. There were four specific cases 
We saw this in um, labor and agriculture in different sectors in Brazil, Costa Rica, and Panama. And union, unions were completely left their own devices when it came to facing these companies because these companies worked in a way where they completely went over the rights of workers. We also saw human rights violations by TNCs. These are, I know I'm, I'm out of time, so I will be closing, but I, there was something that I wanted to say. I think concretely, there have been several impacts of this new system. It's very, very damaging. We saw about this reform in the UN, as long as we don't have binding systems, as long as we don't have due diligence and effective due diligence, we are completely in a system which is not put at the same level all the actors. This deepens inequalities, it unprotects democracy, and it violates the guarantee of rights for everyone this perspective uh, from from the workers uh, and trade unions perspective. Um, now we will hear another perspective again from trade unions, this time from, from Rosa. Rosa, if you could um, sum up your concerns in four minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, convening uh, this very needed uh, discussion. Uh, I must say that uh, what we are uh, looking at and discussing uh, today uh, is uh, the end of a process that uh, started uh, some decades ago. Um, corporates and business and the financial system have been building the architecture of this uh, model of governance that is actually capturing the public power in global governance and at the national level. We saw that in the negotiation within uh, the WTO on uh, uh, plurilateral trade agreements, uh, on free trade agreements, in the constitution of the ISDS as uh, the uh, uh, place where um, uh, contentious issues between government and corporates uh, have been fixed uh, during years and years, uh, always in favor of corporates. And we saw also in the uh, overwhelming power that uh, the corporates were taking over in the uh, UN system in the past years. The creation of the global compact has been the first step in that direction. And also the replacement of UN agencies through the OECD that is concentrating more and more power is establishing the power of rich countries where corporates are have more influence. And I think that we need to be clear that this multi-stakeholderism, uh, this uh, approach where we are all equal and we need to row all in the same direction is something that will increase injustice, inequality, and reduce the voice of workers and citizens uh, to be able to decide for their future. Uh, as it has been said, this is a clear and probably, if they are successful, the final shift of power from governments, democratic institutions elected, where and within the UN, where all governments have the same right to raise their voice and to take decision towards corporates. And we need to stop that because this will affect all the aspects of our life. We have already heard from Barbara uh, referring to the challenges we have vis-a-vis um, -vis the climate crisis, uh, the um, spreading of the digital system, the use of data, uh, well, we saw during the pandemic the 
the fundamental role played by uh, philanthropic organizations, uh, by uh, pharmaceutical corporates in uh, uh, not addressing the uh, fundamental issues. And for us, as public service workers, we have been witnessing and unfortunately suffering the consequences of the capture of governments by corporates that little by little, or sometimes with big steps, have gone uh, uh, replacing uh, the role of public uh, uh, in uh, in many places. Mm -hmm. uh, privatization of health, privatization of education, privatization of water. I mean, water uh, is the first natural resources to be listed in the stock exchange uh, mm -hmm. in New York. What will happen with air? What will happen with all the other natural resources that should be our first common to be to be defended. Mm -hmm. I think there's an absolute need to expose this and to find alternative solutions. Great, Rosa. Thank you so much uh, for sharing these insights. Our last speaker in this round is, is Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy, if you could share with us your reflections on the implications uh, of multi-stakeholderism. Please, you have four minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Sorry, it was a bit late joining. I have, um, it's a very busy day here in Parliament and I had some technical issues. So first of all, apologies if I'm repeating what others have already said, because I only caught a little bit of the last um, uh, contribution. Uh, first of all, thank you to TNI for organising this and um, uh, uh, the organization that we founded after I stepped down as leader of the Labour Party, the Project for Peace and Justice, sees itself very much in line with the work that TNI does. And we look forward to a close relationship in the future and supportive of each other. We have about 50,000 people in Britain, mainly in Britain, that have signed up for the project. The point about um, corporate power and corporate lobbying is not totally new, but it's been galloping pace in the way in which they've started to take uh, UN organizations very seriously. I remember a time when I first went to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, as it was then called, for example, when uh, it would be lobbying done there mainly by indigenous people's organizations, by different human rights groups around the world. And uh, usually it was a, a relatively safe place that opposition groups in oppressive countries could come and uh, lobby delegates and um, national delegations. What I noticed over the years was that there were more and more corporate interest coming into it, more and more corporate um, events being put on, and more and more sponsorship of uh, human rights organizations by um, big business, by oil interest in particular in certain countries. And uh, it kind of hit me in the British parliamentary sense when uh, I looked at the uh, arrangements this is some years ago for the All Party Group on Nigeria and found that it was um, sponsored by an oil company and an airline. And uh, when I was um, a, an officer of the Parliamentary Human Rights Group, I'm still a member of the Parliamentary Human Rights Group, we were offered no end of corporate deals in order to um, finance the group and then keep away from human rights issues such as the plight of people on the, in the Gulf area the, of um, Nigeria, where the Igbo people have been so abominably treated by a succession of all companies. And so the influence is not new. The other question is that, um, as one somebody put in the chat box, that the numbers of people that are working as um, migrant workers or at arm's length from the company they think they're working for is growing apace. Migrant workers are generally appallingly treated around the world. They're the motor and the engine of all of the economies of the Gulf states, yet they have almost zero 
political or human rights within those states. They have no right to vote. They're liable to deportation at any time. And if they have the temerity to join a trade union, they'll find themselves removed very, very rapidly from those places. Um, the corporates who ultimately employ them, but pretend they don't, are absolutely culpable and guilty of this in the oil industry, in extraction industries, in hospitality and in transport and so much else. But all of them are employed by arm's length contractors who pretend it's absolutely nothing to do with them. They're the people that are most abominably treated around, around the world. But I have actually some hopes, some hopes that the uh, power of the message of Black Lives Matters in the United States has had an effect across the whole world where people feel empowered by the sight of large numbers of people in the USA protesting the death of George Floyd and the policing activities across the country. I have some hopes in that. I have some hopes in the opposition that's been mounted to the new legislation the British government's introducing on police power and on borders and nationality that has united a whole lot of people. Likewise, I've got some hopes in the anti-racist movement um, across Europe. But um, we're in an era, and it is growing, <clears throat> where corporate power and corporate media is huge. A small number of media corporations, all of whom are based in California, basically decide whether we can talk to each other or not. They could shut down this call in a price if they wanted to. And indeed, I made this point in a conference call I was doing in Turkey, saying that the authorities in Turkey could shut down this call at any time if they wanted to. And just to prove they could, they did close it down immediately. And then we had to restart an hour or so later, having lost all the um, incentive and um, the momentum of that particular meeting. And so I do think it's up to those of us that are thinking seriously about these issues all around the world to think even more seriously about alternative media and alternative communication means because that power is huge it's also the power of inclusion yeah, yeah. of issues can I just, and so sorry. about getting a message on time sorry i couldn't hear that yeah uh, no i'll just uh, let me just ask the next question maybe you can continue uh, for uh, two more minutes i'll just be very um, brief on that yeah. Very brief. So, Just two, two okay. last points I want to make. Sure. And that is concerning global trade deals and COP26. Global trade deals are on the agenda. The whole agenda of the global trade agreements is essentially one of deregulation of working practices and empowering global operations to give them greater legal dignity in all countries and indeed the power to take a country to court. Happened with Australia over Philip Morris. It's happened with a number of others and will continue to happen. And uh, in the case of Britain, post COVID, we have a, sorry, post uh, Brexit, rather, we have a government that is uh, very keen on doing um, trade deals all over the world. And uh, those trade deals, all of which um, involve a diminution of environmental standards, environment, and, and, uh, and labor conditions as well. And the last point to make is this. I went to COP26 in Glasgow, as I'm sure quite a lot of people on this call were as well. I was involved in a number of um, events, essentially, where we were trying to empower um, local community organisations in Scotland, as well as people from around the world, Brazilian farmers, Indian farmers, and, and so on. Um, what I noticed was that, in effect, COP26 had become almost a corporate jamboree. A corporate jamboree where I found, for example, a company lobbying there um, saying how environmentally conscious they were. The same company in my part of North London is bidding and indeed successfully bid to build a huge new incinerator for disposing of rubbish with obviously the pollutive effects of um, the effluent that comes out of an incinerator. They were welcomed there. Bez was welcomed there. A whole lot of people were welcomed there. And so I think that we have to be more organized, more aware and more effective on a global sense by global trade unions, global community organizations, by global environment groups of what this is about. If this planet is going to survive, it can't survive on this system, which intrinsically is dependent 
on ever and ever faster and ever greater extraction of raw materials from the earth um, and maintaining the levels of global inequality, income inequality that exist. There's got to be a change. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jeremy. And I think I'll just uh, maybe uh, to conclude your uh, uh, points, I think uh, I'll go on to the second uh, question and also ask you, like you, you've talked about some of these global uh, institutions and global organizations. So can you sort of give sort of two characteristics or two ways in terms of your vision, uh, you know, that uh, how mm -hmm. to bring about a democratic multilateral system? So if we, and, and I'll be asking this to the other panelists too, but uh, let's start from you. And um, I mean, at least two or three characteristics of a democratic multilateral global structure that you would want to uh, uh, envision. Um, yeah, so the question was, how would you then think uh, a democratic multilateral global system should look like? If you could just give uh, two points about it. Um, should we go on to another uh, panelist? Uh, maybe uh, Rosa, maybe you could uh, maybe respond to that first and then we will have a round uh, with all the other panelists. Well, um, so we have three I minutes. So yeah. yes, how do you visualize such a system? Thank you. Well, I think first of all, that if we want to have a democratic multilateral uh, system, uh, we need to decide uh, that uh, uh, we want to strengthen the democratic uh, global governance because the alternative is nationalism, is uh, this uh, um, anti-political, uh, um, waves uh, that are impacting in so many countries you now with the nationalism, protectionism, and all these things. Fascism at the end, I would call it. Uh, and if we want to create a democratic institution, I think that first of all, we need to say that the Washington Consensus has arrived at its end that we need to address the issue of debt for developing and least developed country. Uh, and this is not an economic, only an economic issue. This is a democratic issue to be addressed. The second thing, I think that we need to say that uh, we need under the umbrella of the UN, a, a, an international body that fix the rule of the international taxation system, because this is becoming fundamental to rebuild our economy globally, to rebuild our society, but also to stop inequality and injustice. And finally, I think that uh, um, we need uh, to um, to say that if we want a democratic governance uh, in the global uh, uh, system, uh, well, we need to expose the agreement between the UN and the World Economic Forum. And I must say from my perspective as a trade unionist that I would love to see the leader of the International Trade Union Confederation to leave the co-chair of uh, the co-chairing of the World Economic Forum, to leave the global compact, to leave the board of inclusive capitalism and go back to fight for workers' rights from the right side because trade unions are, you know, the tool for compromising for mediation in the benefit of workers. But talking to employer doesn't mean that we need to share their values. Otherwise, what we saw is that not only we are confronted with the co-optation of language, but we are co confronted with a true co-optation in power. Thank you uh, very much, Rosa, for this insight. 
I would uh, like to ask Barbara, you know, um, we've had we've had comments in the chat um, about, you know, even the, uh, you know, about the, 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 the way there is a lot of power differences within countries also, and that also impacts um, and, and their corporates, which are, you know, more powerful and make their governments take certain decisions and things like that. And uh, so, um, and uh, so I want to ask you, because you know, for uh, for us now, Chile really um, uh, gives us a, a, a sort of a, a positive uh, vision of how things uh, could change. So, if you can just um, comment about again the global structures for multilateralism, and how do you think uh, you know those? I mean, coming from an organization, uh, I mean, and 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 the country that you come from. Um, so what would be your vision or your two or three suggestions on what a democratic global structure uh, should look like? Thank you. Well, from the Trade Confederation of the Americas, since 2014, we have been building a platform for the development of the Americas, which envisages a new development model, a new type of governance and uh, renewal of the multilateral system. And for this, what we say is the first thing we have to revisit the role of states and democracy. We are clear and precise in saying that this is essential when we discuss any multilateral system. What we say is that decisions have to be taken within the framework of multilateral institutions by states, controlled by states, and in a democratic way with an effective participation of all of the different actors. There has to be a effective social dialogue and there can't be competition between different actors. Obviously, there's a strong imbalance, especially when referring to transnational corporations and large corporations. This is the first point. The secondly, in our case, in our region, has to do with integration. What is happening in Chile, in Brazil, Argentina and the discussions we are having with regards to the political system and the process of drafting a new constitution do not happen independently. We need greater integration. And within this framework from the International Trade Union Confederation, we say we need to have additional regional integrations. We have Mercosur, Black, and others, which are essential in regions like the Latin America and the Caribbean, we are convinced that we can play a role in the international agenda. If we look at the challenges that trade unionism are facing, they are different in the North and in the global South. So that is why we need integration. And thirdly, we need social participation as a fundamental and essential component of democracy. And fourthly, we need to continue insisting on the need to put human rights but anything else. We have to advance in the SDGs and the 2030 agenda. And this won't be possible unless we place human rights in the center and unless we insist on the need to have instruments such as binding treaties or due diligence, not as something voluntary, not as something just for good faith. It has to be something that effectively controls and puts pressure on those actors that are committing abuse and that are deepening the oppression yeah, and inequalities you. in our people. Thank you very much, Barbara, for those concrete and inspiring uh, steps. Um, Harris, I'll go on to you now. There's a comment in the chat which asked, you know, to, uh, you know, so the question is, how do we reclaim the United Nations? And uh, we request you to give us two points um, on how to do that. Thank you. Um, I think we can learn some very practical things from some recent histories. Um, I actually want to share that we could, in three areas. One is we could build on the major group approach the di from uh, the Rio process, the diversity of social activists and community groups in around the Committee on Food, Food Security, and raise that to another level of creating new structural ways in which there are constituent assemblies of the various groups who work out their own views, 
argue with each other, whether there are 20 constituent assemblies or whatever, in order to provide well-developed ideas for governments to act so that we can build a new system of constituent assemblies around the multilateral system, feeding ideas from each of those areas, be they educators or farmers or, or any of the diverse groups into the intergovernmental system in a coherent fashion. And we could assert a new role for that. The other area we can assert role is to redefine the agenda. Rosa had a, a, a way in which from hard research, it's clear taxes need to be handled differently. We have different values. One of our experiences in what are casually called the conferences of the, of the 90s is where, where the world came together around new urgent topics and had a official consultation around governments, but a much larger consultation with other constituency groups. And one of the ways which we can redefine the agenda is to scope out new subjects for conferences of the 20s. And we have plenty of values, we have plenty of research to say what those conferences should be, but let's add them as an approach to have global conferences. The question that was raised also is, what's the government's doing in this regard? When the Secretary General presented his report to the General Assembly, he had to go back four times this year, the session, in order to get any reaction out of the General Assembly because the tensions were so high. And one of the outcomes is that the president of the General Assembly in February and March are having a series of 10 different sessions welcoming in governments to say their views about how those ideas are developed, as well as some space for civil society and scholars to share their views. So one practical way of engaging and one, supporting governments who are trying to address this issue is to look and follow those discussions and uh, intervene in a pub, through chats, et cetera, uh, for those round of discussion in uh, February and March. Thank you. Great, thank you Harry, very much, Harris. Uh, so we are running a little bit uh, behind our schedule. So for the next round of questions, probably we can only give you two minutes uh, to respond. And I'm also trying to address some of the questions in the chat. They are asking, uh, is it enough to just blame corporates? Uh, we need to regain our governments. We need also to eventually review our own way of organizing uh, or our lifestyles. So what is the key now to organize uh, for a democratic and inclusive order? So let's, let's uh, remind ourselves that we can answer from the different perspectives we are here from, from party perspective. There are also some questions in the chat addressed to Jeremy. So what should parties be doing to regain the state as a public institution, to regain the UN as public institutions obliged uh, by mandatory uh, human rights treaties, for instance. And then we go also over to, to, to trade unions and to uh, other forms of organizing. Jeremy, perhaps we start with you, uh, two minutes, um, and then uh, we go on the round and uh, move to the next question. Thank you. Well, it's not either or, you have to do all of these things. One is you have to be active in political organizations and political parties. Um, I was with the Labour Party for five years, <clears throat> tried to turn the Labour Party into something that was more community based outreaching and a foreign policy of peace, justice, and human rights um, rather than wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and so on. And um, that attracted and excited a large number of people. And John McDonnell, who's on the call in the, I just saw his comments in the, in the chat box, made the points that it's also about expanding and strengthening trade union organization around the world. Because trade unions rely on um, older membership 
in industries that are not expanding or indeed are declining or rely in uh, market e economies on public sector membership rather than the private sector. Some unions, particularly some of the newer unions, put a huge amount of effort into recruiting people into membership in the gig economy and insecure work. And that is the area we have to develop. And I think we can take lessons from the growth of the PT in Brazil over many years, which based itself as a community organization and trying to organize landless workers and migrant workers and, and those groups. That has to be the right way forward. As to UN and other institutions, the UN is the most frustrating organization in the world, as everybody who's ever had anything to do with it knows, but it's also a very important organization and all of its different elements are absolutely crucial. The, I'm, my main focus has always been on the UN human rights activity, which is extremely frustrating, but it is a platform where you can raise issues. It is a platform where you can embarrass governments on the five yearly review. That does mean organizations and NGOs have got to take it seriously, got to be involved in it seriously. It is very expensive to be involved if you go to physical meetings, but the one great thing to come out of COVID is that we've learned to use Zoom and talk to each other in a global way we never did before, which is a good thing. And so, in short, it's political activity, it's community-based activity, it's trade union organisation, and above all, it's um, global and international. But don't rely on the UN to be the only place that we talk to each other and meet each other. Things like moving today are very, very important. And I've done some big calls with Lula and others in Brazil and other parts of Latin America, where we had up to 500,000 people watching on a combination of Facebook, YouTube, and direct Zoom links. It can be done and it can mobilize. Take heart from the success of the Indian farmers who challenged the corporate takeover of Indian agriculture and uh, essentially changed the, changed the uh, politics of India by doing so, at least in that respect. I'm not saying it's a total success in every way. It's not. Mm -hmm. But it was a very, very significant and important step forward. And so it is about global organization and global understanding that's so crucial. That's less mm -hmm. than two Thank minutes, you so by much. the way. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Rosa. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that uh, there are uh, many things to do. Uh, as I said, um, there are uh, uh, fundamental issues to be addressed. Uh, we think uh, that uh, uh, fighting for uh, tax justice and uh, organizing uh, uh, the trade union movement and bridging the trade union movement with civil society engaged in that area is one of the fundamental issues. We think that we need to rethink the uh, division of uh, labor uh, at global level, uh, shortening the supply chains, and uh, uh, being more effective in including uh, all form of uh, jobs, all different kinds of jobs within uh, the trade union movement. But I would like also to say another thing, which uh, is for me one of the most important issues, uh, um, uh, lessons learned from the experience in Chile. In Chile, it has been a, a popular movement uh, that created the possibility of the alternative. Somehow, it has been also a critic of the traditional political parties, uh, the victory of, uh, Boric, uh, of Boric. And I think we need to look at that experience uh, if they can succeed uh, to change, uh, to uh, uh, completely you know, the, the constitution and the most exasperated uh, uh, neoliberal experiment in uh, history, uh, to possibly uh, get engaged to refound all our democratic system, trade unions, political party, and uh, uh, building a new, uh, a new society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Barbara. No, 
Yo diría que lo primero es que estamos en un tiempo. I would say that we are at a time of dispute that is clear in our countries, in the region, but also at a global level. The pandemic has shown the cracks of a model that deepens and that puts the value of the market over the, the value of work and also the, the value of life and, and the planet itself. That has been shown, that is clear, and we have the risk of this going towards uh, popular activities and also like this could lead us to having a deep, deep democracy. We find ourselves at a time of dispute and this requires action in unity, in, in understanding and unity from the social actors, regional um, union, and also collaboration between social, labor, and political actors. Sometimes we end up following the rules of the model that we have and we end up being even weaker. We find ourselves in a situation which doesn't allow us to fight with the same um, tools, with the same capacities as our opposition. So we, I think in general, we have not only to look at the experiences that we have seen, what is happening in countries like mine, like Chile, we also draw uh, learnings from what is happening. We find ourselves in a time of developing dispute. We have to fight an extreme uh, right movement and we have to keep doing that. The battle is not won. Also, the union um, system needs uh, deep change as well. We find ourselves in a time of internal transition because we want to advance in a social movement which identifies as social political movement and allow us to create progressive uh, movements. And of course, this requires to reinvent the way that we have thought of uh, political parties. Some people are union activists, but other people are also political actives and we need to join, we need to join forces uh, because I think the future has hope. We have seen that in our country, but we have a double responsibility to all actors. So we have to be very, very critical. We have to reinvent ourselves and we have to think about the future. Barbara and Rosa for these really uh, exciting and challenging uh, insights and, and ideas in terms of what is key to organize now for a democratic and inclusive world. Now, Harris, uh, you are the last in the panel to speak about that, probably from more from an academic uh, perspective. So what are your remarks on this? I've uh, quite a challenge after the, my contribution from the three, three previous panelists. I really want to pick up on Barbara and Jeremy's observation. We have a, <clears throat> a healthy ability to use our capacities to come up with new ways of working and to build through the net, through other ways of, of starting to create constituent assemblies who have a new narrative a new way of exploring research, a new expression of values, a new way in which we can work across different issues. And we can build those sets of institutions across the globe in spite of, as Jeremy is pointing out, the control of the, of the media at the moment, media math um, software. But the crucial point here is we can begin creating these newer constituencies assemblies who articulate a common set of views within their community that can go to the intergovernmental process and give that viability of, and the excitement of those ideas. And I think that the, the counter to that of our defining new spaces is to be aware, as I was observing earlier about the co-optation of vocabulary, 
because what this multi-stakeholder reality inside the UN system is now being called multilateralism 2.0. And this kind of co-optation of the, the concept of inclusiveness, these are other areas which we can work hard to make sure that that vocabulary is broken apart and made clear to people what is happening in those areas. So thank you again for the invitation to join this process. Yes, thank you very much, Harris. And again, thank you for all the panelists for sharing this, these insights uh, with us now. Now, I would like to ask Solakshana to share with you a little bit more in detail about our book and our database. I saw also already in the chat uh, already questions about uh, what is the book about, what are the key messages and the insights. And we wanted to wait uh, a little bit to present that because we want to present it as a part of this organizing, as a part of this invitation to join forces from our different perspectives uh, to face the threat uh, of corporate uh, capture and corporate power at as an invi open invitation for you to read the book, to use the databases, and to join this effort. So, Selectiona, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sophia. And uh, just to, um, so I'll just share uh, very briefly a few details about the People's uh, Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism uh, and the work till now. So the members of the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism are as follows. So we have Corporate Accountability, PN International, Focus on the Global South, Friends of the Earth International, Geneva Global Health Hub, Global Campaign for Education, IT for Change, People's Health Movement, Public Services International, Society for International Development, and Transnational Institute. And as you know, we've just launched the book, The Great uh, Takeover, Mapping of Multi-Stakeholderism. Um, on uh, various uh, themes uh, on education, environment, health, data and internet, food and agriculture. And we hope that this, uh, that this piece of work would be useful uh, for uh, you know, campaigns, people's movements, academics, political parties, and also governments. Um, so this book has been one of the efforts, you know, I mean, there have been several critiques and we've also um, you know, heard from the panelists um, a lot of uh, action that is already going on um, against this sort of attack on multilateral institutions. Um, so this book was built through a dialogue between the authors uh, who are Marianne Manahan and Madhuresh Kumar with, who were the researchers and along with the members of the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism um, basically developed this book. And the resulting database, the mapping of 103 multi-stakeholderism initiatives uh, is uh, also available uh, online and we welcome you to use it for further analysis and political action. And, um, and uh, you will see in the slides uh, the way to access both the book and the database. And we see this work as you know, a continuing dialogue because multi-stakeholderism is growing and expanding into every field of global affairs. And therefore, this is an ongoing project and you're really welcome and we invite you to participate actively um, in this effort to unveil the takeover of a common future, you know, by the actors of global uh, corporate power and we hope you will uh, join the struggle and the um, uh, and another information about another piece of work that IT for change is uh, doing and will be releasing the January edition of the monthly uh, newsletter data sync, uh, which I think uh, friends have already um, added in chat. Um, and I will now um, uh, sort of request uh, before before going to um, uh, uh, before going ahead. I want to also introduce Brid, whom I missed introducing uh, previously, who is the um, uh, who is from Trans uh, TNI, um, and who is also um, in charge and uh, coordinates the corporate capture. Uh, corporate power project um, of um, transnational um, institute. Um, so um, I think uh, we we'll, uh, go ahead and um, uh, uh, go to Brid um, and uh, uh, to sort of um, summarize and uh, conclude this um, uh, this event. And uh, and I know that there have been excellent questions and comments that have come in from uh, all the participants. 
and and we hope that you know we we continue this conversation and it's really not um ending uh, right now and i would also request brit to then uh, request the panelists at the end um to give uh, to give them a few minutes uh, for final comments thanks brit over to you okay thank you thank you very much sulakshana and um, thanks so much to everyone who's making this conversation um, really very challenging, I think, but also also encouraging. I mean, um, we are not in the mode any longer that there is no alternative. I think we, uh, from the, the struggles and practices of the last, even we could say, yeah, I don't know how many decades, we won't put years on it, but already there are the building blocks of how we can actually go forward to address what is indeed, and I think has been summarized very well by different, the different speakers in relation to where we're at. I mean, this is, this is both, I mean, in a way, it's an, an incredible kind of um, conjuncture of uh, corporate capture in the area of the economy. I mean, that's been going on relentlessly for the last 40 years. But I think what we are facing now is the corporate capture and the reality of this in politics and in democracy. I mean, we are in front of um, a coup d'etat, I think, of, um, of the democratic institutions. And I think this is, you know, it's been touched on by the speakers in relation, for example, to Glasgow. I mean, there is no question, but the financial sector in all its variation from banks to uh, stock exchanges, really, they organize very well. They, they uh, positioned to be in charge of the future direction in a sense of the uh, climate policy. And I think this is something that is very, very stark. We've also seen it in what's happened in relation to the handling of the health, um, the pandemic, et cetera. So I think, um, you know, we have generated also here and in, in a sense, the exchanges have underlined that we're in, in a, in a sense, in a very uh, advanced stage, actually, of corporate, um, of corporate capture and of this, um, uh, yeah, in a way, application of multi multi stakeholderism to um, global crisis, but also to politics. So I think this is very very important. But I think our conversations have also generated. I think Jer it was Jeremy who said at the beginning, uh, hope. But all other con uh, panelists have actually contributed not only in terms of um, you know a hope that we aspire for, but also indicated. Uh, the building blocks that have been done in in the struggles uh, in the privatization anti-privatization struggles in the uh, struggles of indigenous peoples in relation to the integrity of the planet um, and I think it was really important that the the reality of um, migrant uh, workers across the global supply chain was also um, highlighted and I think um, we, we look to the social movements and we look, of course, especially to the achievements of the labor movement in terms of embracing this sector of, uh, of workers in our, in our 21st century. I, this is going to be a crucial part of remaking, if you like, the protagonist forces and the protagonist movements um, going forward. And I believe that, um, you know, in our in, in this effort today to hold the round table, um, we really see it as, as um, well, it, it's not a beginning step. People have said this issue and this challenge is with us for a long time, but also the struggles on the ground have been there for a long time. I think what we are facing is um, the moment to find the way to converge the struggles and to converge across sectoral struggles. This is going to be extremely important. And also the interface, of course, with political parties and political formations. And this, I believe, will be what will open, in a sense, the next steps in this particular process that we are facing. We are um, extremely, in, in a way, encouraged by the work of the People's um, Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism, uh, this was really a very um, is, is a very dynamic and cross-sectoral 
approach of movements um, and um, it's, it's giving good pointers for, for the future. Um, we will build on the, yeah, the very specific proposals that have been made about how we can continue. Uh, we have, um, uh, well, there is, uh, I think, in, 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 the, in the chat, uh, a link. And first of all, there, there are these movements that are part of the, of the People's Working Group. Um, their constituencies um, have uh, all, the con all the connectivity that uh, we might want. There is also an email, the CP team at TNI.org, for a, like immediate connectivity if people, if people would like that. So basically, I guess all I would want to say is that um, the, yeah, today is more, more than a wake up call. It's actually a call to action. And we hope we will be revisiting from the People's Working Group, we will be revisiting uh, with the panelists also um, moments to designate a bit more clearly uh, what the next steps will be, and especially to address the proposal from the UN Secretary General of a series of summits, multi-stakeholder summits, and indeed, as Rosa said, to break the connection between the UN and the um, World Economic Forum. I mean, we want back a people's public institution of the UN. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I, as um, Sulekshana said, we ask the speakers, the panelists now to make their comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Britt. And I would uh, uh, request uh, Jeremy to first maybe start the comments because he needs to go um, he needs to leave. So the final uh, comments that the panelists may have. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, it's a very busy day in Parliament and I'm about to go speak in a debate about the dreadful situation in Ethiopia, OT Grey, and the many refugees so on in the neighbouring areas. And I'm sure you'll understand the importance of doing that. Can I just say thank you, everyone, for being on the panel and for the contributions that I've heard. And it shows the importance of the TNI and importance of managing corporate governance and corporate power. Because corporate power is the biggest lack of democracy in the whole world, where global corporations can think through how to get past the popular demonstrations about climate change, popular demonstrations about social injustice and morph themselves into the politics of any one country. And they're not actually accountable to anybody. And whilst I, I made the comments I did about the uh, corporate greenwash that was um, much in evidence in Glasgow during COP26, what I would like to say also is that I was actually inspired by a lot of what I saw and heard and met in Glasgow, which was a coming together of environmental groups and many other civil society groups from all over the world. And to me, the most inspiring part of it was when a lot of climate change activists joined in with the Glasgow refuse workers on their strike because of the way they've been so badly paid and they recognize that refs workers are a very important part of our society, albeit their, what they do should be recycled and reused rather than disposed of and burned. But that isn't the point. The point was that they sought a sense of solidarity. And I think that's what gives me a lot of hope. But we do need to be much sharper on recognizing the power of influence that the um, big corporations have. Davos is their big entertainment point, but there are many others. And when the World Trade Organization and others meet, it's with them in mind. Next year, COP is going to be held in uh, some form or other in Egypt. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how that works out because there's some massive human rights and free speech issues that have got to be addressed in Egypt as well. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out. But that is a time when we also all need to be there as well. Um, and saying, well, these global corporations might be ending fossil fuel emissions in Europe, to some extent in the USA, to some extent perhaps, but also in other countries. But at the same time, investing, providing countries like Botswana with no alternative other than to exploit their coal reserves. These are huge issues. They're huge issues. And unless we can take those communities with us 
and those working class organizations and trade unions with us, then we're just talking in a small group to ourselves. So there has to be a green industrial revolution, which does challenge corporate and global power, which does empower people all around the world for system change. Without system change, the climate crisis will not just continue, it'll get much worse. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, input. Um, um, and and uh, I know you have to be going, so uh, thanks for, from all of us. And I'll go on to the next panelist. Uh, Rosa, uh, your final uh, remarks, comments. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Rosa. Sorry. Uh, um, I, I think that we are on uh, the verge of a breaking point uh, for uh, uh, the sustainability of uh, our planet, social sustainability, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, all are a health, or all, uh, all are at a, a breaking point. Uh, the crisis is global, is also political and cultural. And I think this is the moment to be vocal, to be bolder, to take action and uh, to call things with their real name, less diplomacy and more straightforward messages and actions. This is the time to change. And I think we need to use all the democratic space that are available for us and build a new one in alliance with all democratic uh, organizations and institutions uh, to rebuild uh, from the foundation uh, our uh, um, a democratic uh, global governance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosa, that was very um, inspiring. Um, so can I request, um, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Can I request Barbara to please uh, go next um, with your final comments? Well, I'd like to thank you for inviting me from the Trade Union Confederation of the Americas. I'd like to share our commitment towards the shared goals we have with TNI. And in this framework, I'd like to highlight once again that perhaps the biggest challenge we face today, both for political parties in their role and in the civil society and in our struggles, is to come up with a united strategy. That is a big challenge. We have experience, we have knowledge, we have proposals, we have platforms to develop alternative models. So we have accumulated all of this. And th today, what we have to do is to unite in strategy. We have to base this on our local and national experiences, but we have to overcome this to build a true global united strategy. The same is true for the local struggles. We need to upscale it to have a global community struggle. We from the Trade Union Confederation of the Americas, we had a beautiful exercise with the Continental Sessions Against Neoliberalism, where you have feminist organizations, a well much of women, trade unions and environmental movements coming together in a space to converge. And we think we have to replicate these spaces globally. Why? Well, to be able to confront the model. If we're fighting to change the model, we will always be coming up against a wall, but we have to be able to have a social and political approach to overcome this. Otherwise, our locals will continue to be local. And I think we at the Trade Union Confederation of the Americas, we are fully committed to continue building alliances and to be able to continue working with TNI. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. I mean, absolutely. I think this is the time to build more uh, solidarities across geographies and sectors and people and professions. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, you know, for that and for being here. So um, I will now go to Harris uh, for your uh, final comments. I would like to 
build a little bit on one of Sophia's opening remarks that multi-stakeholder governance is, an, is evolving in its practice in different arenas that we have been describing. And the report that just came out from TNI is a result of a dozen organizations and networks working together to examine how multi-stakeholderism is appearing in their sectors. And so I extend on behalf of all the panelists and TNI to other communities to reach out to TNI and to the members of the group of the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism to join these discussions, to explore with each other. And as Barbara said, and as Rosa said, to build alliances across all these groups as we figure out how this new form of corporations now wanting to sit directly at the table of governance and how this is being evolved in different sectors of the world economy as the only way to deal with global inequalities in a massive way. Thank you. Bien. Muchas gracias, entonces, Harris. Okay, thank you so much, Harris, Rosa, but Barbara, Shalaksana, and to all of the panelists and participants, thank you for your summaries and inputs. It's been a huge pleasure to see such an energetic exchange in the chat, sharing materials, questions, and comments. I think the call put out by Jeremy Harris, Barbara, and Rosa of finding creative and brave ways to work towards a systemic change and to change the model and to free up our political and organizational imagination. That is the effort we are embarked on right now. So on behalf of the working group, I'd like to thank the TNI for its generosity, for making available its resources and its team to open up this collective space. I think we mentioned this before, and I think it's important strategically to organize around a united agenda to confront the big challenge ahead of us. So thank you all very much. Thank you to the participants. Thanks to our interpreters. And we will remain in touch to build this together. Thank you all very much.